Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. Hey, everyone. In this episode, I am continuing to share my experience in Villene, Hungary. Last week, we listened to Peter Mokambe, Master of Wine, discuss Cabernet Franc around the world. This week, it's our turn. I began our Cab Franc moment by talking about the status of Cab Franc Day on social media, and then Michael elaborated on the status of Cabernet Franc in California in a speech entitled California Cabernet Franc, No Longer in the Shadow of Its Progeny. So grab a glass or a bottle of Cab Franc and enjoy. And afterwards, if you could scroll down and leave us a review, we'd greatly appreciate it. We'd love to know your thoughts. Thanks. Slancha. much for uh, bringing my husband Michael and myself here today. Uh, we are very honored. Um, and I'm going to talk more about uh, the beginning of Cab Franc Day, which is a holiday that I started. And quite honestly, um, I started it rather sarcastically because there's every other wine holiday. I don't know if that's here, um, but in America, it's almost every day is a wine holiday. And there was Merlot Day, there was Carmenere Day, there is a Cabernet Day, which some people can say Cabernet Franc can fall under, but in America when people say Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon is what comes to mind. So there's Sauvignon Blanc Day, in fact there's two Sauvignon Blanc Days, um, and I thought that where is my beloved Cab Franc? Nowhere. And, you know, Cab Franc is the parent of, along with Sauvignon Blanc, uh, the parent of um, Cabernet Sauvignon. It is also a parent of Merlot. It's also a a parent of Cabernet. It apparently got around quite a bit. And um, so I decided I was going to start the holiday. And um, to my surprise, it really took off. I am not the only Cab Franc lover out there. so Cab Franc is believed to have been established in the Le Bourne region of southwest France sometime in the 17th century. And Cardinal Richelieu is the grandfather of Cabernet Franc. So he actually transported the vine cuttings to the Loire Valley. And um, I'm not really sure how he got away with that because apparently he just put it in a bag somewhere and brought it over to him, uh, brought it over. But it has been there since um, since he planted them. So they have actually been planted at the Abbey of uh, Bourgade under the care of an abbot named uh, Breton, which, as Peter spoke about, is another name that is what Cabernet Franc used to be known as. So it, originally it was Breton, and to this day it is still associated with Cab Franc. And my little wine glass over there, uh, Cabernet Franc has a lot of names that it goes by. And those are uh, the names that we have seen. So by the 18th century, the plantings of Cabernet Franc now went from being called uh, Breton to being called Boucher, (coughs) were found throughout the right bank of uh, Bordeaux. So Franca, Pomerol, and obviously saint Emilion, which is where I believe it is its happiest place to be. Um, so Cap Franc um, is known uh, repeatedly, as uh, Peter had said, uh, Chateau Cheval Blanc is the best known for that. And although I didn't have a picture of the sideways photo, um, I was speaking about that also that in America, that sideways movie destroyed Merlot, and Pinot Noir skyrocketed in sales because of that movie. And if you actually pay attention to the movie, it says, he says he doesn't drink Merlot, but it's because his wife loves Merlot. It's not that he doesn't like Merlot, it's that his wife, his ex-wife, does not like Merlot. And what this shows is, at least in America, how much a single movie line can make people change their attitude. And in 
case of Pat Franck Day, when I started it, I literally was, I still is myself on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook, tweeting out things about Cab Franck and constantly bringing people in. And in our first year of 2013, we actually trended on Twitter second uh, during our annual <coughs> chat. So people are out there and they love Cab Franck and they want to experience Cab Franck in all different expressions, from the, uh, from the bell pepper to the non-bell pepper versions of it, to the lighter body, to the uh, fuller body Cab Franck. Um, so why December 4th? So I uh, do not like holidays that rotate. I think it's a very confusing concept to have a holiday that's like the third Thursday of this month or whatever. I wanted it to be a specific holiday. And December 4th is actually the anniversary of Cardinal Richelieu's death. And as I said, he is the grandfather of Cab Franc. So he passed away in uh, 1642 on December 4th at the age of 57 and I chose this date to honor his relationship with Cabernet Franc. Uh, he, he, depending on what view you want to look at him, he was either a rather good guy or a not so nice guy. Um, his motives, he was very involved in the uh, tenure of the um, French reform. But as history shows, his motives have been very debatable. Some feel he was a very patriotic supporter of the monarchy, and others were very feel he was just a very power-hungry cynic. And that is actually how he is portrayed in the movie The Three Musketeers. So that is Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Richelieu. Now, my little holiday that started off um, in 2015 was actually the first year that I started promoting it. We started promoting because my 2013 vintage was coming out. That was our first vintage. So I was trying to bring some light to the Cabernet Franc. In 2016, we had 15 wineries that participated. And um, I, in addition to having the winery, I write an award-winning blog and have a podcast, so I am always on the phone. I'm always in social media. And that is where you sell wine, at least in America, that is where you sell wine. People are on there looking to what other people want. The millennials, the younger people that I've been hearing that Villanay has been trying to talk to, they are on their phones. And that's who you have to reach out to. Uh, in, uh, so 2016, on December 1st, I had 285,323 accounts were reached on Twitter. Okay, I'm not bringing in Instagram or Facebook. Uh, and there were 832,542 832, impressions. So impressions mean if I send something out to somebody and then they retweet it and then they retweet it and so forth, those are the impressions. Those are the people who actually physically took the time to write something about Cab Franc. And that was on December 1st of the first year. December 4th, 417,805 accounts were reached and the impressions went up to 897,608, okay? The following year, 2017 stats, we had 29 wineries uh, participating where they sent me information, so they sent samples out to um, bloggers that, I, that are considered influential bloggers and they wrote uh, about Cab Franc Day and about the individual wines. We had celebrations in Australia and China. And on December 1st, we went up to 661,229 accounts reached and 903,127 impressions. But on Cab Franc Day itself last year, we had 1,460,405 accounts were reached. And the impressions were 4 million 
727,626 people were talking about how much they love cat frog. That's a lot of cat frog lovers out there. So 2018 actually sort of kind of officially started today. We have wineries. What I do for these wineries is they send me information about them. And on my social media channels, I create spotlights for them. So today was the actual first spotlight, and it happens to be another winery in Paso Robles. What they get is uh, Twitter chats. Thank goodness for automated Twitter. Okay, I have chats. I have tweets going out all day today about that specific winery. And then on Facebook, they have a page on Facebook. I have started a Cab Front Day web page. The producers who are participating are on there, so people can go to this website and find out how to buy their wines, find out the technical sheets about these wineries, so that everything is right at their hands. And again, on Instagram, there are stories about these wineries. So each day leading up to Cab Franc Day, they will be a new winery that the meet that the people, the millennials, can find out about the wines and place orders. And on Cab Franc Day itself, December 4th, we'll be holding two chats. One is general, where people just come in and they just talk about how much they love Cab Franc. And then the second one, these wineries come in and it provides an opportunity for the social media world to talk to you, the wineries, talk to the winemakers. And the winemakers are online. I have scheduled specific times. And then the people are allowed to ask whatever question they want. And it's the best way for you to get your name to those millennials, to get them to the people that you want to sell your wine to and introduce your wine to. So that, in short, is how I've done Cat from. And I've been saying since day one that it is definitely much more that it much more than a blending grape. And as the Cursino Wines, that's how we feel. We focus in on Cab Franc, and we are pursuing our passion to prove to the world Cab Franc is a fantastic grape. Okay. So next, Michael's going to come up, and he's going to talk a little bit more specifically about Dracino Wines and um, Cabernet Franc in California, the statistics of how it's growing in California. I'm here to talk to you about a little bit about California Cab Franc and kind of it's moving out of the shadow of its progeny. And that progeny is actually Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay? So a little bit about us. So Lori talked, talked there before. Um, so I'm, not, I'm actually the uh, winemaker for Dracina Wines. I also uh, have a master's degree in food science. So kind of a chemistry background by trade. And that actually keeps the business going because that's our day job. So the winery is actually a future business for us, a future endeavor for us. It's about keeping those day jobs going to continue to fund the winery while it continues to grow. So we talked a little bit about Cabernet Sauvignon being king. So everybody looks at Cabernet Sauvignon and says, that is the king of wine, right? Everybody thinks about what are the big brands, what are the big prices of, of wine. It kind of all starts with Cabernet Sauvignon. But as Lori mentioned, without actually Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon wouldn't exist. So if we go back to a little bit of monarchy, actually Cabernet Sauvignon should be the prince, Cabernet Franc should be the king. Right? So if we think about it in, in those terms. Just kind of a li little interaction. Um, I think we talked about probably the biggest Cabernet Franc brand. Um, if you Google famous Cabernet Franc brands, you actually don't get very many. I asked it at our table last night over dinner, um, and I just got a couple of blank stares. Of what would be a famous Cabernet Franc brand? You ask for a famous Cabernet Sauvignon brand, you just continue to roll them off, right? So you continue to list them. So this uh, little friend of ours, Wine Folly, has come up with a bunch of different Cabernet Sauvignon brands that might exist. So they exist from Bordeaux, they exist all over California, they exist within Chile. If you kind of Google famous Cabernet Franc brands, what you come up with is Chivalhan. Right, so it's about pushing the great variety, it's about making it um, more fame, uh, better for people around the world from a, from a great perspective. Now I'll talk a little bit about California production. Um, as we kind of think about, these are all going to be in American terms. You might have to convert 
um, acres to hectares or tons to um, tons to pounds. Um, but kind of what you see here is this is actually pulled from the USDA agriculture. So every year, USDA, which is the government agency in the US, compiles a list of all the um, grapes that are grown, whether for table grapes or for wine grapes across the, across the state. So these are pulled in from California. And what you can see from this list is actually um, a downtrend in 2008, 2009, 2010. For those of you that don't remember, there was a major global crisis around the world. Right? So there was a drop in grape pricing there. Slowly tick up as the economies around the world start to grow. You see a big downtick in 2015, and that was actually coming out of a, a long uh, four-year drought within the state of California. So we, we saw a lot of grapes coming online, a lot of grapes coming into production, thus the price of those grapes go down. But in overall, what you see is that red wine is driving the majority of the market. Right? So when you do an average, the average is the, is the orange bar up top at 778. Red wine is driving most of the value of within that market. And this, again, is across the entire state of California. We go in a little tighter. Talk about varieties within wines. Um, you see Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon making up the majority of the tonnage crushed within California. Cabernet Franc doesn't even make the list. The Cabernet Franc is kind of shoved to that other pie chart down there on the end. It's going a little bit tighter. Um, so California, comparing Cabernet Sauvignon, which is what we talked about a little bit, as well as comparing Cabernet Franc. So what you see is actually the total acreage and the total crushed tons between the two. Cabernet Franc is actually 2% of total Cabernet Sauvignon. So Cabernet, Cabernet Franc is very little. But what you see on the far left side is dollars per ton. What you see there is actually Cabernet, Cabernet Franc dollar per ton is worth more value than Cabernet Sauvignon. And we're paying <coughs> We focus in a little bit tighter. Um, now we talk about Napa Valley. So we're actually growing wines in um, Paso Robles. This is from one of the third wine you'll actually taste here. Um, you can kind of look at bearing acres within Napa Valley and cost per ton within Napa Valley. So the bearing acres in Napa Valley, Cabernet Sauvignon is roughly 10 times more than what it is in Cabernet Franc. But on a value perspective, Cabernet Franc is actually equivalent value for Cabernet Sauvignon. Actually equate this to a couple of different things. One Cabernet Franc as a marketing grape doesn't, most consumers do not know what Cabernet Franc is. Cabernet Sauvignon is grown, it's well known for all of the consumers. Um, you can charge a higher premium for those grapes, but Cabernet Franc, unknown by the consumers, known by a very small few, and people are willing to pay up for it. So as Peter talks about in his slides, you compare those prices. Um, in Napa Valley, with some premium Napa Valley Cabernets, they would be on par, but they're much smaller in volume. Got a little bit about how we take Cabernet Franc from vineyard to the bottle. This is uh, kind of a really nice, really nice slide from Lang Reed, which talks about um, Cabernet Franc in ripeness perspective, which is a very green varietal wine uh, of uh, lacking a ripeness, going through to extremely high ripeness on the far end. And as the as it becomes more ripe, you move to more of the the darker fruit flavors. You move into more of the chocolate profile. Um, what's the presence of acid? So it becomes a little more flabby wine as acids aren't present. We talk about acids within, within this group quite a bit. So the, the more it ripens, the less acid you get, the higher the bricks content, and then, of course, the more alcohol level. We've all talked about common, common Cabernet Franc descriptors. Um, have red fruit, we have dark fruit, dark and milk chocolate, tobacco, spice. Um, bright acidity, we all talk about bright acidity being very much a food-friendly a food -friendly wine. Um, I kind of want to focus in on that vegetal profile, which is kind of what we all talk about when we think about Catatonic of those delicacies and those nuances. So, Cabernet Franc, um, if you think about actually those pyrazines um, that are coming and delivering that, that pepper profile are actually present in a lot of other wines. So Peter talked about Sauvignon Blanc being um, that pyrazine profile from New Zealand. It's present in Cabernet Franc, <coughs> present in Merlot, present in Malbec. So pyrazines are naturally present in those particular grape varieties. And each wine style is driven by personal preference. 
right? So it's personal preference of the winemaker, personal preference of the grape grower. And the amount and profile of those pyrazines can be altered in the vineyard. Right? And the regular wines, we talked about it before, tend to show less pyrazine, tend to show less of that bell pepper profile. But for you, as a winery, as a winemaker, how much pyrazine do you want? How much do you want to be known for that bell pepper? Right? So that's a question that you have to ask. Some research has shown um, vineyard orientation, now it's going to depend upon your ground, it's going to depend upon where you're specifically growing, um, but it tends to be more of a southwest to northeast vineyard orientation. Within, this, within California, where Cabernet Franc is typically grown, you get a morning sun that comes in, and actually you get a very strong marine layer that happens within the state. So that marine layer helps protect the grapes from heavy amounts of sun, but you want to have that hot afternoon sun, you don't want it baking down on the grapes because it creates what's called sunburn, right? So it'll essentially ruin your grape profile. So how do you manage that sunburn profile while still exposing those grapes to sunlight? You do it with some trellising systems. So coming in, it looked like a lot of vineyards were, were done on VSP. Um, the, the top one, uh, a two-wire vertical sprawl, is very common within the central coast of California, primarily used for, for grape growing uh, or for raisin growing because it tends to be uh, very high levels of um, vigorous vine growth. So it could be an impact by soil, it could be an impact by the uh, clone that's chosen that's going to grow. But VSP is actually more common within your more premium growth, grape growing and vineyard areas. So within vineyard management, um, leaf pulling um, on the back side, on that back side of the exposure, tends to provide filtered light. So as sunlight hits those grapes, it actually starts to break the pyrazines down. So the more sunlight you can have hitting those grapes, the more the pyrazine is going to be broken down. So you'll see a lot of vineyard managers go through and actually pull the leaves on the back side of the fruit. And there was a study actually done at the University of Washington that showed early, early on in sunlight exposure to the bunches right after they've set actually increases this thing called quercetin, which is part of the um, uh, anthocyanin profile of grapes. So the more the queer symptom is there in the grape profile, actually helps prevent sunburn. So you expose, this, expose those grapes early, you get uh, quercetin built up, that in turn allows you to have more sunlight hitting the grapes and in turn exposing more and more sunlight and breaking down those uh, pyr uh, the pyrazine levels that, that are in there. So I wanted to do a little comparison, um, looking at kind of the latitude of where we grow grapes within the state of California, within Hungary. Um, and latitude, actually, if you kind of look at it, uh, Hungary is actually pretty far north. So just kind of looking at it on a world map, you say actually Hungary is a little too cold. We talked about Cabernet Franc being able to uh, be grown in numerous places around the world. So maybe that maybe that's lending to it. We kind of zoom in and put the continent of Europe over the United States. You actually see kind of Portugal would be an ideal place to grow Cabernet Franc. I don't know too much Cabernet Franc that's grown in Portugal. Either, Peter, maybe you know more than I, but I'm just not aware of any no, no. Cabernet Franc. <laughs> <laughs> so the arrows are where we would be growing our grapes, and then you see Hungary and Vilne up top uh, in the center, center of the chart. So in UC Davis, um, they've actually used this thing called the Winkler scale. And the Winkler scale is actually a measure, so I heard a little bit about sunlight hours. Um, but this is a, the Winkler scale is something that uh, Lori and I were trained on, which is every degree, uh, every day, and every hour um, that the conditions are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees C is considered a growing day. So you count up the number of, number of days that you have, number of hours that you have within a day that is north of 50 degrees. Because that's when grapes and vines tend to be, tend to grow. So we talk a little bit about California's degree days and the regions that exist. So California tends to have uh, all, th all five regions that exist. So starting at 2,500, 2,500 to 3,000 degree days, 3,000 to 3,500, 3,500 to 4,000, and 4,000 degree days being the hottest. So you'll see a lot of that where table grapes are grown tend to be very hot conditions because you're looking to turn those table grapes into raisins. So we talked a little bit about Cabernet Franc, which is the two wines that you're, uh, the first two wines that you're pouring there. And actually, uh, in the slide, there's kind of a center, kind of a center highway that exists um, on both sides. It's called the 101. 
um, not separated by anything, not separated by anything. It's essentially a roadway. Um, and the two different sides, it's called the east and the west side of Paso Robles. <coughs> the west side of Paso Robles tends to be more calcareous soils, and the east side of Paso Robles tends to have more limestone soil. So actually limestone being a composition of calcareous soil. The other big difference between the two, the west side of Paso Robles almost has no water. So a lot of their wells produce 10 to 15 gallons per hour. So very, very low uh, water conditions. On the east side of Paso, you tend to get hundreds of gallons per hour. So when it comes time to watering your vines, um, you want to be on the east side in dry growing conditions. If we want to talk about bring degree days into, uh, into Hungary and into Villanay. So actually Villanay is actually in the three or four regions. So Villanay, when you think about it, um, is actually very similar to where we're producing our Cabernet Franc in the state of California. So even though lat latitudinally it's similar, or it's much further north, in growing degree days, the conditions are very similar. So I heard uh, a couple of other speakers talk about the Mediterranean climate um, within Villanay. Here you're experiencing that Mediterranean climate, which is similar to uh, the state of California. Some vineyard observations, some of the things that, as I'm a winemaker, that I look for um, as I'm growing through. So uniform ripe clusters, um, clusters that are not particularly uh, ripening together. We tend to drop, green drop those and drop them to the ground. Walking through the vineyard and chewing on the grapes. Um, so you're looking for, I'm particularly looking for skins that release from the fruit, so not, uh, not tough skins, but skins that release from the fruit, and looking for ripe fruit flavors. Brown, crunchy seeds. So I heard a couple of comments last night about having seeds that were brown and crunchy. So you don't want seeds that are green, delivering green tannins. And of course, measure of, of chemistry. So bricks, uh, I think you guys typically measure potential alcohol. So we measure bricks, which is dissolved sugar content, pH, and titratable acidity. So essentially using all of these things to say, when am I going to pick my grapes? Right? As, as a winemaker and working with the grower, when am I going to, to want to pick my grapes? So we've now gone through harvest, um, and we're bringing the grapes into the winery. So we want to sort what we call mod, so matter other than grapes. So we want to pull out leaves that are, were brought in by the pickers, um, and we're starting to sort them on long sorting tables. You can go through a whole cluster for descending. Right? So a lot of Pinot Noir producers will use whole clusters, toss everything into the, into the fermentation of that. We actually go through a destemming and a very mild partial crush. Um, so we want to have a lot of the, a lot of skin contact, a lot of juice yeah. that's present in those Cabernet from. I haven't heard anybody talk about it here, but no, I haven't heard anybody mention cold soaking. So cold soaking is actually kind of a, uh, a popular thing. We do a 48 hour to 72 hour cold soak on all of our wines. Um, primarily to extract, um, extract those flavors and extract the color. Um, and at that same time, we're adding some tannins to dissolve and actually bind the color together to prevent the color from breaking down over time. So we put in what's called some artificial tannins um, into the overall grape profile. Um, we're trying to extract the anthocyanins, and we're trying to stabilize, overall stabilize that color. And then, of course, we're continuing to measure um, what is the chemistry of that, uh, that must profile. Now we're getting some wine, some additional winemaker decisions. Um, are we going to add nutrients? We talked about the research study earlier, adding uh, yeast nutrients. Um, how often are you going to punch down? You're going to punch down once a day. You're going to punch down twice a day. You're going to pump over. Um, our wines are go through a double punch down um, throughout the day until we reach about five bricks, and then we stop punching down. Do you want to separate the free run juice, or do you want to keep everything together? So we typically keep everything together. Pressing versus SO2. So we typically SO2, we like to use, we don't use native yeast. We don't want to take that risk. So we typically SO2 to about 50 ppm coming into the fermentation, kill everything that's in there that might be coming in from the vineyard, and then we inoculate with commercial yeast. And then oak versus stainless steel tanks. So do you want to ferment in oak? Do you want to ferment in stainless steel? Do you want to age in oak? Do you want to age in stainless steel? We, uh, we ferment in big plastic tanks, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. we talk to the wines, and then we age um, in oak. Of course, you've always got the marketing side, so that's what I allow my, uh, my wife Lori to do. 
So do you want to bulk age your wine or do you want to bottle age your wine? What's your closure options? So looking around as we were going through, the classic wines, at least that I've seen within Villanay, are two taps. The other wines typically tend to be cork driven. You want to be a varietal or, or, or a blend. So a lot of the wines that we were tasting were varietal Cabernet Francs, um, but you want to turn blend in other wines. I've heard a lot of people reading through the press that actually blended wines tend to be better, tend to be more complex. Um, I don't agree with that. I think if you're allowing to fruit to express itself, um, you can do varietal wines. The three wines that we grow from California are all 100% Cabernet Franc. And that's about finding your style. Right, so we talked a little bit about pyrazines. Um, we talked a little bit about how you grow them, when you pick them. It's about finding your own style and being your own difference. A little bit about a little bit about us, just to kind of give you a, a little bit of background. Pursuing our passion is actually one of our taglines. Um, it started with a wine in 1992, Ferrari Corano, which is a Chardonnay in California. That was our aha moment. I think we could probably all look back to say, what was the wine that actually turned us on to wine? Right, what was the one that kind of, what's the one that, that created an impact to us and say, this is what we want to do. That for us was a 1992 Ferrari Toronto Chardonnay. And we started visiting Napa Valley, um, just as kind of going on a vacation. We found this wine from William Harrison, um, which is the wine in the middle. It was a 1991 Cabernet Franc. Um, we were getting ready to leave the winery and the, the young girl behind the counter said, hey, we have this other wine open, would you like to try it? We had never heard of Cabernet Franc before. We said, sure, let's, let's give it a go. And we just, we were wowed by it. And he said, if we ever got into this business, this is what we want to make. I can still taste that wine today. I can still put it in my memory. It still lives there. And it's kind of my goal of what I, what I want to make around Cabernet Franc. What is our brand? So you didn't see the bottle. Um, that's actually a constellation of Draco, the, the Dragon Souls in the sky. So that was our dog for 14 years. His name was Draco. He was a wine runner. That's what's on our label. He's what's on our label. Um, it was actually named after, um, he was named after that constellation. Um, and when we tried, started to look after things like constellation, there's this giant brand, constellation brands in the US, right? Um, so anything related to constellation, you would not be allowed to do anything related to constellation. So we said, okay, what's the other names we can use? Uh, we're both scientists. So the name Dracaena is actually the genus name of the Draco tree. So it's kind of a palm frond tree grown in the, grown in the south. So Dracaena wines is how we came up with that name. And then that's our logo that's on the, on the far side. A little bit about the wines that you taste. So um, these are very young wines. So these are 2016 wines. We've actually went from when we started in 2013. We've sold out of every wine and every vintage. So this wine is actually, uh, was bottled in July of this year. Um, the technical details are in there are actually from the crush pad. So the crush pad of those wines um, came in at a pH 4.1, had an acid of 0.23, and, and a BRICS level of, of 26.3, leading to a potential alcohol a little over 14. So we added acid back to that wine to bring it up to 5.1. So we added tartaric acid back to the wine bringing 5.1 and a pH of 3.6. So um, as you're going through and tasting that wine, that wine's had 10 or sorry, 20% new oak. Um, and it's a blend of both clone 4 and clone 312 within California. So if you're tasting it, I'd encourage you to give it a big swirl to kind of give it a chance to open up. The second wine that you taste is actually what we've just released, which is our reserve wine. Those wines were treated essentially the same off the crush pad. Um, the big difference in those wines is the clone. So this is 100% clone four, and it's also 50% new French oak. So it's 50% new French oak, medium plus, medium to, medium plus toast. Um, and that's primarily the difference. So we were kind of focusing in on barrels. That'll kind of give you a chance, same, same grapes coming in out of the vineyard other than the clone. Um, treated the same way within the winemaking process other than that barrel sample. So you can kind of see what happens from a, a barrel aging to wines within, within our region. And the last wine that's on the list uh, we brought over. So Latin Reed um, within the state of California actually was one of the first pioneers of Cab Franc within California. So he's been making Cab Franc for well over 30 years. Um, again, 100% Cabernet Franc sourced from Napa Valley. 
um, 14.5 percent potential alcohol, 5.6 uh, 5.6 grams per liter for the pH of 3.66. Uh, he's aged his wine 16 months in French oak. Um, didn't talk about the value of those. So the first wine that's in your glass actually retails for $34. So that'd be about uh, 28 euro, I think. Um, the second wine, our reserve wine, retails for $45. So that would be about uh, 38 euro. And then the last wine here, uh, the third wine, is uh, $52, and that would be about 45 euro. Thanks for listening to Dracaena Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, and Periscope as at Dracaena Wines. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud, or email us at DracaenaWines.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find us more easily. We are found on all of your favorite aggregators. To subscribe easily to iTunes, go to bit.ly forward slash Dracaena podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Dracaena podcast. And that's a capital D for Dracaena and capital P for podcast. Please check out our award-winning wines and find out about our wine club at DracaenaWines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha!